What is going on guys? So in this video, I'm going to be showing you my nine favorite no code tools. And these are the tools that I personally use to some extent. And for each tool, I'm going to be telling you some of the pros and cons. And that way you can kind of figure out how you can get it to fit into your own no code workflow. Now, these are going to be some tools that you're aware of and probably some tools that you haven't really heard about and haven't really used and perhaps uh, you're going to learn a thing or two in order to add some of these tools into your own uh, no code workflow. All right. So let's begin. So the first tool I want to talk about is bubble, right? Bubble is, you know, this is what they say, the best way to build web apps without code. And bubble, in my opinion, is the 300 pound gorilla of no code tools. It's probably one of the more popular no code tools. Uh, it's one of the most kind of straightforward, I would say, no code tool. It was one of the first no code tools that I gotten started with. And so we're going to log in into my account and I'm going to show you like a simple app, tell you some of the features. And this is going to be useful as we go forward. And we're going to start to compare it, this tool to some of the other tools. All right. So here I am in my account. I have a simple app that I built just as a proof of concept uh, for another project. And so we're going to open this app up. I just want to kind of show you what's happening. And the way this app works is that it simply displays a list of basketball players that it gets via an API from a third party API. And so this is bubble. You have your design, you have your workflow, right? I can add an event I have my general elements. These are like these app wide application wide things that are happening. Users log in regardless of what's happening in my app. I also have elements. These are based on elements. So an example of a general element would be users logged in, pages loaded, do every five seconds. Uh, then you have elements and then you have custom events. You also have your data types. We're not using a data type because we're actually pulling data from a third party API using one of the plugins here called API connector. So if I expand this, this is kind of like I have various calls here. I can expand this call. And I have a bunch of different calls that I can make. And when you run this app, it essentially lists the name of players. It gets data there and it's very, very easy to do it. So all I have to do is go to preview and that's going to execute the app and it's going to run. It's going to get all this data from a third party provider. And so when I run this app, I get a list of players. I have the first name, the last name. I have the kind of position they played. And then I have a learn more button, but that's not connected to anything. And so what I like about Bubble is that in my view, this is one of the more straightforward tools because uh, when you think about no code stuff, you really have two things to kind of really think about. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's fairly straightforward. You have your design and you have your workflow. And really what sets a lot of these tools apart is the way they implement the workflow. Okay, the workflow works different as you're going to see when we cover some of the other tools later on. You're going to see that the way they do workflow is different. Now, what I like about Bubble is that if I click on a button here, let's say I click on a button, I double click, I can just start and edit workflow very easily just right from that element. Very, very simple. And in my mind, this is a very straightforward way of doing it. Now, maybe your way or the way you think is different. And we're going to talk about it in a second. But in my view, this is kind of very straightforward. We have the data. We, you can style it. You have a ton of different plugins. This is another thing that sets Bubble apart is that you have a big community, lots of different plugins. I always use this API connector whenever I need to connect to somewhere else. Uh, this is by Bubble, then we have settings and we have locks. So honestly, if you are trying to get into no code, Bubble should probably be the first thing you look at because once you have experience with Bubble, a lot of these other apps are going to be very, very easy to use. And so that is Bubble. You can check out a very lengthy and comprehensive video on my channel where I talk about from A to Z. I have a lot of videos on that on Bubble where if you want to learn some of the more advanced features. All right, so the next tool I want to talk about is AppGyver. Now, AppGyver, I believe, has a slightly steeper learning curve than Bubble. It's, it's a little bit harder. I would say, in my opinion, it takes a little bit more time to get going with AppGyver just because of the way it handles a lot of these elements, how it binds data from a database or data from an external API. 
to your UI and I'm gonna show you right now how it works. So I'm gonna log in into my account right here. All right, so here I am in my account. I have one project here and this is called the COVID tracker. This is just one of the last apps that I wrote here in AppGyver to show people how it works. And so we're gonna open it up and this is just a simple app that gets data from an external API. It's exactly like the bubble example, except it's a different niche. It gets different kind of data. And so right off the bat, the way, you know, App Guy World works is very similar to Bubble. You have your UI elements here, right? We're looking at UI elements. We're looking at forms, lists, you know, you have various primitive stuff like that. But where it differs is where you have to kind of get the data, where you're working with the data. So if I go here in this data tab right here, uh, we have our data resource, okay? So whenever you're working with data, uh, external data, any kind of data, you have various connectors, you have a Google Firebase, file uploads, but in this example, we're doing REST API. Whenever you're working with data, you have to define it and you have to define all the methods, all the requests that are associated with that data. So for instance, we have here get collection, we have get record, we have create record, update record, delete record. And all of that is defined in terms of that, you know, third party API. So for instance, get collection, uh, this is kind of how it looks like, right? This is the, the host name and this is the URL path here. And then we have a key and label. We have all these other things. You can test it. So for instance, I, if I type Italy, I'm gonna run my test, I'm gonna get data here, right? So this is kind of the data, confirm, recovered, critical, deaths, latitude, longitude, all of this thing from that specific request, right? This is a single, this is a collection, but in this example, as you can see, it's an array, but in this example, it's just one, it's one record, right? I can put Spain as an example, I can run test. And then when you're out, so let's exit out of it, when you're designing your UI, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be binding elements. You're creating a two-way binding, essentially. Sometimes it's going to be a two-way binding. Sometimes it's going to be a one-way binding, depending on if you're modifying the element or not. And so as an example, we have here a list of countries. And this is just, you know, a simple element, right? This is a simple element that I created. These are essentially static fields, okay? I just put them there. I just put a bunch of countries. This, on the other hand, this is connected, right? It's currently bound to data item and repeat. And so for a lot of people, it could be a little bit complex to get it working, okay? But in my opinion, even if you're not going to be using AppGyver, the way they did the whole binding thing is, is amazing in my view. It's very, very elegant. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. So I, I really like the way they did the whole bindings here, uh, how, it's, how these elements are bound to the data that we're working with that we defined earlier, whether it's a data uh, inside the app or we're getting it externally, or it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's a, you know, we're getting it from the cloud or, or whatever. Now, the other thing that um, AppGyver does a little bit differently than some of the, these other app builders is the way you can do logic, right? So remember guys, we have our data, but we also need to do logic. So all you have to do is click on any of the fields here and you can go down here and add logic to title. Then you have all these logic elements. You can create a dialogue. You can, you know, set app variables, page variables, data variables. You can do navigation. Uh, you can do a lot of things. This is component tab. This is the event, kind of that if then condition, right? If something happens, do that. So AppGyver, I would say it's not as intuitive. For me, at least, you know, Bubble was a lot more intuitive starting out and maybe that's, perhaps why Bubble is a lot more popular, but nevertheless, the way they do it is very, very elegant. And I really like the way they do the whole bindings, the way you're essentially connecting data from you know its initial source to the way you're showing it, and also the way you're modifying the data, right? This is very, very cool. So there's a lot of things to, uh, to cover. And if you wanna learn more about AppGyver, check out some of my videos. I have a lot of comprehensive training on AppGyver, including, you know, the simple stuff to more complicating things. All right, so the next tool I wanna show you is Thunkable, okay? This is another really, really cool tool. It says create your own native apps with no code. And Thunkable is fairly different uh, in terms how it handles logic, how you can do UI stuff from the two previous tools that we covered. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log in and I'm going to show you one of the apps that I built. A very, very simple app, but it's going to be enough to show us how, how the logic works, how the, uh, the UI works and stuff like that. So here we have the UI, very simple app. And the way this app works is that we have a data source. And in that data source, we have Spanish language learning tips. So I have five tips here from a data source. I'm going to show you exactly what I'm doing. And when you click on any of these tips, it goes to the second screen and it simply displays the tip. Very simple app. I just want to show you how it works. So on the left hand side, we have all of these components. Okay, just the same thing. Very similar to Bubble, very similar to AppGyver. And but when we go into the block section, you have blocks. Now, this is radically different than both AppGyver and Bubble. It's a completely different kind of paradigm, as you will, right? You have your core logic, you have app features, data sources, you have UI components. This is the UI component. So, as an example, uh, we have this data kind of this, what is this, a data viewer list, right? In Bubble, this would be like a repeatable list or something to that extent. And now, if we go to blocks, what we're doing is when data viewer list is item clicked, and you can pick something else, you have these things, right? So I can drag this out. So initially, when you are working with it, all you have is this yellow, this control, right? If you go in here, you just have this yellow thing. And when you're building this thing, you're essentially putting jigsaw pieces together. So this yellow thing right here, what we need to do is we need to find something else that fits. And this is the set thing, right? And I put set. And then this thing is also extra because this is multiple things like if, then, but then does not need to be just one uh, expression. It could be multiple expressions. So if I drag and drop this, we have two expressions. So when data viewer list is clicked, you know, any kind of item is clicked on that list, you are essentially, we are setting a variable on an app level, right, on an app. It's an app variable, app level variable, row ID to the row ID, and we're navigating to entrepreneur tips. We're kind of passing, we're setting a data. We're not passing data. We're setting a data on an app level, and we're going to entrepreneur tips, which is uh, the second kind of the second tab here, and then we can pull that variable. We can get the data that we need, we can do all kinds of interesting things, right? So for instance, let's play this. Uh, let's run this app and let me show you. So if I click on this first tip here, it goes to the second one. This is actually the second tab. So this is the first tab. I click on it. It goes to the second tab. It says read Spanish magazines. It essentially just uh, shows the, the, the tip that we clicked on. And the way it's doing that is essentially we're passing the row ID and then it's pulling in the row ID. It's querying it from the data source, the row ID, and showing it to us. So if I go to this second one, this is the query part, right? So if I go to design, this is the second element. I go into blocks. It says when entrepreneur tips uh, is open, when that uh, tab is open, you can set label to whatever. And then we're getting all of these. We're getting the data from the database and we're getting the app variable and the row ID. So that is how, kind of how um, this Thunkable uh, app works. It's radically different. It took me some time to adjust because I thought it was uh, very, very simplified. But at the end of the day, this is just another way of doing it. It's also a very, very powerful way of doing it. You have all kinds of interesting things, all kinds of UI. This is our data right here. So I can, I can click. This is kind of we have five tips here. This is what we're working with. You can also implement uh, Google Sheets, get data from cloud. Uh, API calls, all of this stuff. And also, uh, it's another tool to put into your toolbox as well. Next, we're going to go to Adalo. Now, Adalo, in my opinion, is great tools for building uh, mobile apps as well as web apps. I've been using it for building various uh, prototypical prototypes for mobile apps. And in my view, Adalo is actually one of the simplest and easiest tools to get started. It's easier than Bubble, I would say. It's easier than AppGyver, uh, easier than Thunkable. It's just very simple. It feels to me like this is a tool that, you know, like a five-year-old kid can use. Like, it's just so simplified. So we're going to log in into my account, and I'm going to show you a simple app and, and explain to you why I think it's so easy. All right, so here I am logged into Adalo, and the first thing we're looking at is, no surprise, the UI, which is pretty much across the board, 
uh, with, with these other tools, right? We have the UI. So we have two tabs here. We have a list of scooters. This is an app I'm, I was just testing for uh, to, to display electric scooters. And so we have some scooters. We have a list of scooters. And then when you click on it, you go to a detail page. Very simple. It's kind of this list detail, um, you know, design here. And, you know, you have your components here. You have your screens. You can add a screen. You can add a blank screen. You can add screens with components. Uh, we have simplest. We have all kinds of interesting things. Now, what makes a Dalo simple is the logic. Okay, so for instance, if I click on this list, we have our list and we have all this stuff, you know, having to do with the list. So if I open the simple list and I go in here, I can, I essentially have a click action. Okay, not only, so not only it's very easy to create a list because in Bubble, uh, it's a little bit more involved. It's also very easy, but it takes a little bit more steps. There's more stuff. There's more fields here. All I have to click on it and say, what is this a list of? I say scooters. I have more uh, I have more stuff, more collections, more uh, more tables here. But I say scooters, and there's a filter, right? There's a filter. In Bubble, it's going to be multiple steps. I can sort it. I can say name A to Z. I can do that. And then right away, we have a click action, okay? It's not something separate. It's not something I have to worry about. It's automatic, right? So this is a link detail. I can click on it, and I can say, okay, screen detail uh you know a transition do I, what kind of transition do i want slide left slide right uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is super easy it's probably missing some advanced functionality that some of these other tools have but in my opinion this is so easy just to build a prototype i can add another action so you know this could be a link uh it could be a create you know i can do an update uh, you know i can do all notifications custom actions stuff like that the other thing that I really like about Adalo is that when you are displaying the name, right? So this is, you know, we have the list and then we have the individual elements here, right? Scooter name. It's so easy. So for instance, I can just say this is a scooter, but I can also click on this add magic text and that's going to be a variable. So I want a scooter name, I hit name. I want, uh, you know, price, I hit price. That's going to display the name and the price very simple and then the formatting and all that and then you have various things you have the left section you have all that so in my view like the way it does logic is probably the easiest out of all of these tools and that is why adalo is really my go-to tool for building uh mobile apps it's just so easy and and really really easy to get started i think they really nailed it so i also have a video on adalo if you want like a more comprehensive view a deep dive stuff like that it's there, you can have a look. All right, so moving right along. The next tool I wanna show you is Glide Apps, okay? Create powerful apps, websites without code. So I use Glide to create mobile app prototypes, kind of like a Dalo, but when I want something else, maybe I want a different uh, template to get started with, maybe I want, you know, uh, some different functionality, some different things. It's very, it's, it has very similar functionality to, uh, to Adalo, but the way you configure apps is very, very different. So we're gonna log in into my account and I'm gonna show you some of the functionality of it. All right, so here I am logged into my account and we can create a new project. You have all of these uh, pages. We can start from a template, but I'm gonna log in and show you a sample app that I built for another project, right? This is a little travel app. So we're gonna click on that. We're gonna load it up. And Glide has a lot more functionality. It has uh, a bunch of other features uh, when you compare it to Adalo, but it works in a very similar way. So the way this works is that we essentially have a list of cities, and then when you click on a city, you get a description. So not an overly complicated app, fairly, fairly simple app, but let me show you some of the functionality. And so right here at the top, we have our data. This is my data right here. This is internal data, but we can also link it to Google Sheets, we can get uh, data from Google Sheets, or you can have internally stored uh, store data. And so the data could be living in Google Sheets, or it could be internally to the app. It's really up to you. We can go back to the app, and here we have customizations, appearance, you know, all of these sign-in screens, stuff like that. Now, when we go to our um, uh, UI, the way, the way the app works, you know, you can create different screens. So for instance, I have, uh, I can create this kind of bar here, kind of a little filter that displays 
Uh, it has uh, all of them or a search bar. I can also create a new tab. So for instance, right away I had some tabs disabled. I have sheet one, chat, shopping cart. We can disable those again. Lots of things that you can do. But then when you click on, let's say we click on this thing right here, right? This thing right here, this is fully customizable. Okay, so as you can see, all of this, these are the fields that we're using. We have title. So if I click on title, I can customize how it's displayed, right? Title is right here. Title is actually all of this field right here. This title has, you know, this title, details, image, uh, stuff like that. I can change, you know, I can change how it looks. Then we can click on the button and the button has its own title, has a mood, it has an icon. We can have an icon, maybe a house, whatever, book your hotel. I think that's uh, applicable in this example. And you have options as well. You have visibility. You can do conditions when it should show up, when it shouldn't show up. There's a lot of things that, that you can do. And so Adalo is kind of like the easy tool when it comes to all of this. It's very, very easy. But sometimes you want more customization. You want to tweak various things. And that is when I go to Glide App. So I use both of these tools to create prototypes for mobile apps, but I use them interchangeably, right? Sometimes I use one tool. Sometimes I use another tool. Uh, but both of these tools should be in your toolbox. All right, so moving right along. So right now I wanna talk about other tools, not, not specifically app builders, but tools that you, know, you definitely should know about at least, and tools that are gonna be interfacing with app builders to provide uh, value uh, to your end users as well as to yourself. So the first tool I wanna cover is Zapier. Now Zapier is kind of like bubble when it comes to automation, when it comes to creating workflows and gluing different things together, right? Gluing maybe two bubble apps or bubble and an API or, you know, bubble and a dollar, gluing various uh, apps together in that respect, right? So I'm gonna log into my account. We're gonna take a look at some of the functionality there. All right, so here I am logged into Zapier and right away what you're seeing is connect this app with this one. That's kind of the, the mindset is you're connecting two different apps. You're not connecting how data flows within the app, you're connecting two different apps. So we have some recommended workflows, right? I can save new Gmail attachments to Google Drive. I can save new uh, Gmail email matching certain trades to Google Spreadsheet, right? So you have a lot of things. And really Zapier has a lot, a lot of apps that you can do. So for instance, if I try this one, let's say I want to save new Gmail attachments to Google Drive, I just said try and I can essentially combine it together, right? So here we have an automation editor and in Zapier, when it comes to Zapier, these are called Zaps. So all they are is our individual automations. So we have this trigger, right? And this is very important to understand. It's not that important to understand how to configure a certain Zap or how to configure a certain app. But what is important is the structure, the, the, the way things work. We have a trigger, you have an action and you have multiple actions. So it's this if then. Now, some of these triggers are gonna be from an app. Some of these triggers are gonna be time-based. That's kind of the main difference. Some, because some apps, uh, they are not, they are not, they do, either they do not support Zapier or they work in different ways. And so in that case, you kind of have to do a time base. So like every hour do this, every 15 minutes do that. But a lot of these apps, they have triggers. Now triggers obviously better, that way you're not, uh, you don't have a timer and you don't have to run something every 15 minutes if there's no action waiting to be uh, taken care of. So in this case, we have a trigger. I can edit this trigger. I can sign into my Gmail and I can you know, connect my Gmail account. And then what I can do is I can go in here, only continue if, you know, choose app, you can create filters, uh, you can filter attachment is this. So remember, this is a certain scenario that we're looking at various attachments. We don't want every attachment. We want to filter it. So here you can filter it and then you can take an action based on that attachment, okay? Now, if an app is supported by Zapier, if Zapier has support for that app, you have a lot of data at your disposal. There's all of these things that you can do. If it doesn't, then you're really limited because it's not gonna, it's not gonna understand what the app does. It won't understand like what is an attachment or what is, you know, what is an email. It's not gonna understand what that data means. And so that's really an extent of Zapier is you're looking to create workflows. You're looking to create automations. If something happens, do this. Uh, you know, if, if uh, 
you know, if somebody sends you this email, it's from a certain person, uh, you know, have a notification on your phone, that kind of thing, or connect to Bubble and insert data or insert a spreadsheet, that kind of thing. Zapier is great also. Zapier is very, very powerful. And another tool that's very, very similar to Zapier is called Integromat, okay? Integromat is, I would say it's a little bit more coding friendly. It has a lot of these little workflows that are very, um, they're very familiar to people that have been doing software development. So somebody like me who comes from a software development background, I looked at Integromat and I immediately knew, okay, this is a tool I can easily work with. So we're gonna log in, I'm gonna explain to you the tool, give you a tour, and I'm also gonna show you a couple of my own workflows and what they're doing. All right, so here I am logged in uh, into my own dashboard here. And if we go into scenarios, scenarios are basically zaps in Zapier. When it comes to Integromat, they're called scenarios, but all they are are automations, workflows, whatever you wanna call it. So I have two workflows here. One is essentially, uh, it connects one, you know, it connects a piece of website when somebody submits an email, I want that workflow, I want, uh, you know, I wanna take that email and, you know, add it to another service. So here we have a webhook, essentially when something is triggered, it's a trigger, right? We can click on it and we can kind of learn about it, right? This is a webhook. As you can see, this thing right here, that's a trigger. It runs immediately. It's not a time-based. So if I click on it, I can kind of learn more about it. This is my hook here. So if I'm making a request to this thing, it's gonna get this data and it's gonna do something here. It's gonna connect to Mail Bluster, which is a uh, email automation service here. So we can click on it and we can get that. We're essentially getting an email and you know I can also specify first name, last name, but right now I'm only specifying an email. We have additional information. I can also put an, a, an IP address, uh, stuff like that. This thing right here, this is actually another website. It's another website that's supported that is uh, getting data from this webhook here, right? So for instance, let's say I wanna create, I have tools, I have a repeater, I have an iterator, right? Repeat, repeater basically repeats something over and over again. It's kind of like a for loop in a programming language. We have an iterator that iterates over a bunch of elements. We have an array aggregator that takes everything together and aggregates it. So there's a lot of things that you can do. It's very, very powerful things. We have templates. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna take a look. So take a look at this. Add new incoming emails to Google Sheets, save new Facebook lead ads to Google Sheets. There's a lot, a lot of things that you can do. And if you are doing something that's not supported by Zapier or it's not supported by Integromat, you can do what I'm doing uh, and basically create webhood. Here's another flow I wanna show you. This is my other flow that I, I was working on. This is Google Sheets. We are iterating over each row in the Google Sheets, right? So if you go into Google Sheets here, we click on this, it loads the spreadsheet here. Well, I don't have that spreadsheet anymore. And it essentially, it returns three rows and then we have an iterator that, go, that goes over each of these three rows and does something with it. In this case, it sends an email. This is why it's very, very powerful. Now, the other thing that's worth noting here is that this is not executed immediately. This runs on a schedule. So if, if we click on this, it runs every day at 7.43 p.m. In this example, this is slightly different. Like I said before, you can have something that runs immediately because it gets data and it's listening, it's waiting for that data. Or you can have something that runs on a set schedule. So anytime you wanna combine stuff, you wanna, you know, you have Google Sheets data here, you wanna, you wanna send an email, you wanna pass it to your friend, you wanna do something. Integromat is just an amazing, an amazing tool. So here we have a webhook. I have a bunch of different webhooks. And essentially what these are is that these are URLs Right, we have an email webhook, and we have you know a basic uh, URL webhook. And anytime I send data to that webhook, another automation is triggered. This is very very powerful. I really really like this. I can create more webhooks. I can you know uh, automate it the way I want it to automate. And they have a generous free plan. It makes things very very easy. All right, so moving right along. Now we're gonna go into automate.io. And automate.io is very, very similar to Zapier, Integromat, but it works slightly different. And so it's also worth 
your time to kind of learn more about it. Here you could take a look at their integrations. They support Gmail, Notion, Slack, Shopify, Google Sheets, PayPal. You can go into marketing. You can create a lot of interesting automation. So it really depends on what you're doing, right? Integromat is very kind of developer friendly. Uh, Zapier is like the granddaddy. It's like the 300 pound gorilla when it comes to automations. Uh, this thing also fits into a certain niche. And so you kind of have to take a look. If there are certain apps that are not supported uh, in Zapier or Integromat, you might come in here and this is more business oriented. There's Maybe there's a good chance you're going to be able to get the support that you need. You can go into forums, Unbounce, you know, Wufu forms, Google forms. There's a lot of things that it's doing. And in my view, this is more kind of business. It's, it's business oriented that you can do. So we're going to log into my account. I'm going to show you the UI very, very quick. All right. So here I am logged in into automate.io and it's telling me to choose your own app. So we're going to choose a couple of apps that we use, let's say. All right. So here I am logged in into automate.io into my account. And it's very, very similar to the previous two products that we talked about, right? You have, you can add a row in Google Sheets. Uh, you can send an email uh, on a new form entry in type form. You can send a direct message. Uh, you can do a lot of things. What makes these apps, uh, these tools different is first of all, the UI, right? It, you know, some people may prefer Zapier. Some people may prefer uh, Integromat. Some people may prefer Automate.io. So if I click on this, and I'm looking at it, right? I need to link Typeform. So I need to log in to Typeform here. I need to authorize. And I need to link my Google Sheets. Once I do that, I'm going to see a UI screen. And so in my view, Automate.io is very, very intuitive. But I would definitely recommend to all of you, if you're looking to do any kind of automation and you will have to do some kind of automation if you are serious about building an app because you're going to have events that are going to be happening. Maybe you're going to be getting external data. Maybe you you know you you have some some stuff happening inside the app and you want to send the request out. All of these things is very very important. I would urge all of you to essentially test drive them yourself. Go out and log in into Automate.io, log in into Zapier, go into um, Instagram ad and see which one of these apps is more towards your liking. I tend to use Instagram ad more, but I will be using Automate.io. Uh, in the future as well to do various other things when it comes to business logic and stuff like that. All right, so moving right along. And right now I wanna kind of switch gears and show you a tool, actually a couple of tools that I've been using previously that are very, very helpful when it comes to uh, building different projects and running my business. So the first tool is Appify. So we're gonna log in and I'm gonna show you exactly what this tool does. All right, so what Appify is, it's essentially a scraper. It's essentially a way for you to run various little scripts that go out and get you structured data from unstructured data. So as an example, right, we're gonna go into actors here and actors are essentially uh, scripts that you can run. So for instance, if you scroll down, we have a web scraper, we have a Google Maps scraper, we have Instagram scraper. You can get booking data, you can get Airbnb data, you can get all kinds, there's all kinds of different scrapers here that uh, essentially could do all kinds of interesting things. If you go to view all, you can get, you know, business, developer examples, e-commerce, games. This tool solves a lot of problems when it comes to data. Because if you want to build an app and maybe you don't have data, uh, maybe you want to show certain data to the user, Maybe you want to populate the app with some kind of uh, dummy data. Uh, maybe you, you know, you're doing some kind of intelligence uh, analytics type kind of software. This tool really solves the problem and it solves it in a very, very elegant way. So these are essentially built-in scrapers that you can use and you can modify to do a certain task. So for instance, if I go into tasks here, I have a lot of these tabs. So this is kind of my custom scraper here. And this is a way for me to get structured data from websites that do not have structured data. And these are all publicly available data, but the problem is it's not in the format that I want. So for instance, I have here one scraper. If I open this task here, it has some JavaScript code that essentially gets this data and parses it and gives it to me in the format that I understand. Now, the only reason I have actual code here, I know this is a no-code channel, is because I needed to write some JavaScript code in order to get the right data that I need. However, 
this is a no-code tool. A lot of these tools, like if you go to on the front page, if you check out all of these, these are all built for you. And all you have to do is, you know, enter a couple of pieces of data, you know, specific data. Maybe you're searching for a specific query. Maybe you need to access a specific website. So all you need to do is enter maybe a host name, a URL, a specific string, a couple of pieces of data. And so once you set up one of these things, you enter that specific host name, string, some data, it's going to go out, it's going to run it, and it's going to give you this data back. And then you can take this data and then you can import it into the tool that you want. You can import it into a Dalo, uh, Bubble. You can import it into, um, you know, Glide, whatever. You can even create a web service where you can pull that data from um, AppGyver or you can pull it, you can create an automation from, you know, from uh, Integromat or Zapier or anything else. It's a very, very powerful thing. And doing it yourself is just going to be very, very difficult. It's going to be a pain to do it. And this tool does it for you in a very, very professional way. Last but not least, I want to show you a really, really great tool uh, that I use all the time. And this is called Arengo. And what it essentially allows you to do is build frictionless signup flows with any stack. So essentially, you build up a form and that form has logic with it, right? So it's not just like a Google form that, you know, you enter, somebody enters data and it's saved into a Google sheet. This essentially, you have logic. You can create, you know, HTTP request. Uh, you can redirect the user. You can, you know, execute another job somewhere. It's a really, really great tool and it's very, very nicely executed. So we're, we're going to log in into my account and I'm going to show you exactly how it works. All right, so here's my account and I have here a form. And if you open this form, this is what you're seeing. You have a, three questions, you have an email, but the way you can design this form is super, super intuitive, right? We have all of these fields, data types, phone. I can just drag and drop it here and it's going to do validation for me. It's going to be automatic, right? And here I can configure that field. So it's not exactly like Bubble or AppGyver, but it's a, it's a very useful tool if you need to build up a form and you need to do some kind of logic with it. So here I can design, I can um, create a bunch of attributes. I can modify the attributes and the settings for this specific field. And then when I'm done, I can, I can display a thank you block. I can redirect the user to another page. I can add plus and I can add a flow, right? So for instance, I can add a flow right here. And let's say I want to create a flow when step one is being processed, when form is being processed. When form is submitted successfully, okay, I can create an empty flow, flow two. Let's say we call it flow two. There is my flow, and then I can go out and I can actually uh, modify that flow, right? So I can click on flows here. Let me save that first. I can click on flows. Here's my flow two. I can edit it. And this is, you know, this is a whole program here, essentially, right? I can do plus. I can have an if they if then condition delay state store variables HTTP request, you know sign up to WordPress all of these apps Amazon HubSpot, Active Campaign Zapier Mailchimp so it's kind of like you know an automation it's kind of like you know a mix between something like Bubble and something like you know uh, Integromat right it's very very simple it's not as you know advanced as Bubble you're not gonna build some crazy app here. Uh, you're not going to build a crazy, it, it does not compare to things like Bubble or AppGyver. But it's very, very simple. It's very, very easy to get started. And I use this all the time for creating these so-called smart forms. Not like, a, you know, your basic Google, Google form that, you know, somebody just fills out and it creates a row in Google Sheets. This is a smart form because essentially uh, I can do various logic. It's going to store the data, but I can, you know, I can... Inter interface with another app. I can save the data. I can connect. I can do a, you know, I can create a JSON object. I can, I can, you know, connect to something. I can do a HTTP request. Lots and lots of interesting things that you can do. Really, really great tool. Really amazing. Uh, they have a great team behind it. Really nice. I use it all the time. And that about wraps things up for me. So I really hope you enjoyed my favorite no code apps that I use. Let me know in the comments below what kind of apps do you use. Let me know what kind of apps you want me to review, what kind of apps you want me to make videos about. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments. And if you enjoyed that video, give me a big thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.